morning, everyone. So uh, we're happy that you're here, as Eric mentioned about uh, the Christmas tree. Some of the kids are excited when they came in. I didn't see it in, in the middle service by the first service. Some of your parents just realized that Christmas is only a couple weeks away. Uh, so because of scheduling, we had to do it a little bit before Thanksgiving. So appreciate uh, the staff uh, this year as well as the uh, boomers came in on Friday and helped uh, finish up, and we'll get the stage done hopefully next uh, next week and uh, have that ready as well. So thank you guys. So thank, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's. Go ahead and leave. All right. So I did change up my goals for this year up until uh, usually about a week ago. My goal was to stay in the same weight range that I was in high school uh, in. So that was that's been my goal for I don't know the last ten or fifteen years. Um, you laugh, I'm actually serious. So I actually weighed this when I was in high school. And so, but my goal is changing. I amended it. Uh, we had a vote last night. I'm going to gain 20 pounds from this day to the end of the year, okay? So anybody else want to join my, my bandwagon, right? So uh, anyway, this is always a tough time of year to, to fight off the temptations of, of gluttony, which is what next, year, next week's message is about. So... All right, just kidding. I, I always do that. I say that, but one of these times I'm actually going to do it. So, uh, the message is a part two because last week we had, uh, in the third service, we had 22 people follow the Lord in baptism. Yep. <clears throat> so, we had to shorten, them, uh, shorten it so everyone could stay on, on pace. So, if you got an outline coming in, some of the fill in the blanks are there. And then, uh, so that was from last week. If you missed last week, you can grab, I don't know if we have CDs left in the, in the lobby. You can always go to the church's website and download or watch it online as well, all right? So let's go over the outline. Let's kind of get caught up, and then we'll jump into today's lesson. So we said that there were three ideas that, we, uh, that Paul begins to lay out in Ephesians chapter 6, all right? So remember that when we started the series two weeks ago, we started talking about the miracle of deliverance. Because this is the series on the miracles of God. And so we talked about the miracle of deliverance. And that is we began to learn how the enemy fights. That there's a demonic force. There's, an, there's a good force. So Paul believed just as there's like physical people around you. That there is a physical world and then there's an invisible world. And in the invisible world is a spiritual battle that's taking place. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> you are born into this battle. And it's real, it's active, it's taking place in and around our lives. We don't necessarily see it, but we certainly feel it in our life in the area of temptation and all those kinds of things. And so we talked about demonic forces and all that stuff in week one, not in a creepy way, but just kind of in a way to kind of help us understand what it looked like. And then we ended in Ephesians chapter six, where Paul talks about putting on the full armor of God. And so I wanted to peel away from that and do two messages on what, how do we fight the spiritual battle that we're in. And so Paul talks about the spiritual armor. And so last week we talked about that, and then this week we'll finish up and then next week we'll go on back into the miracles, okay? So in your outline, real quick to get caught up, <clears throat> there are three thoughts that Paul lays out in Ephesians chapter 6. And if you want to start in around verse 10, if you have your Bibles. So he says, first of all, that you have to know how to dress, right? So you have to figure out what the right clothing is, the right armor, as he would put it, in life that we are to put on the full armor of God in our life. And then the second thought that we looked at last week is that we have to know who and how the battle's taking place. If you do not understand who you're fighting and you do not understand how they fight, you're going to get run over, right? And again, too often when we talk to believers, it's like, so how are you resisting it? It's like, resisting what? Well, the spiritual battle that you're in. Um, who am I fighting? And if so, if you don't know that, then you're going to end up getting run over in your spiritual life. And so he talks about the schemes of, the day, uh, of Satan in verse 11. And then last, the, the last thought that he talked about was using all your armor, putting on the full armor of God and being able to withstand that. And so then last week, we talked about two of the pieces of the armor that Paul is talking about. So pause and let me go back. So Paul, in writing in the book of Ephesians, is in prison. 
So he's writing to the church in Ephesus, that's where we get the name Ephesians, and he's chained to a military guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the guards would rotate, and they would take off the handcuff off of themselves, put them on the next guy, the next guy would have them. In those days, not like today, if you ever go into jail or prison today, the guards that walk the floor don't have weapons, typically because it's not a safe environment, because they could get overrun, those kinds of things. But the people on the catwalks, they have the guns. In those days, the, the guards were set up for battle. So just as if they were to walk out and fight in a physical world, they were standing in prison. Paul's standing in front of this guy, and he begins to draw the parallel between a spiritual battle and a physical battle. And he begins to recognize that the armor that the guy has on for a physical battle is the armor that we should wear for a spiritual battle. And he begins to draw the parallel between the pieces of armor that he has. And so last week, we talked about integrity, knowing the truth and living it out. Not just knowing it, because that doesn't set us free, but it's actually living it out. And again, if you missed it, you can go back to, to last week's message. And then we talked about number two in your outline is purity. And that is where we keep, uh, we're, uh, we're keeping my mind and my motives pure in life, right? And, and so this is where we're, we're being fitted with, with that breastplate of righteousness in our life and that we have that, okay? So I want to go to the picture, if we can, uh, there. there. Thank you, Gail. Um, was it Gail? Yep. And so here's what we talked about in last week. We talked about the belt of truth, which, which they believed would strengthen their core, just like a power lifter would have today, a thick belt. And then in front of him, he would have area, uh, uh, some, some things that would protect his front. We don't need to get into that. You guys certainly understand that. If you ever played any sports, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and then he would have the, the breastplate of righteousness, which was not only protecting the front, but also the backside. So that was the full, um, the, to protect the, the, the main organs in a person's life. And then today we'll talk about the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is ultimately the word of God, okay? So that kind of gives you a visual of, of, where, of where we're at. So let's go. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to go to verse 15. So we just covered 10 through uh, 14. Now we're going to jump into verse 15. And he says in verse 15, and with the feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, all right? So in those days, they fought with cleats on. So we would have, you know, if you play soccer, or football, baseball, whatever, and, and if you're into sports, you know, even in certain types of, of uh, sporting fields, you change out the cleats depending on what's taking place, right, because of, uh, of it. So in there, in that area, in, in the Holy Land, it's almost all limestone. And so everything is, there's gravel everywhere. So they didn't have pavy, uh, pavements and those kinds of things. And so when they're fighting, they're fighting on very small pieces of gravel. And so they wouldn't fight in Crocs, and they certainly wouldn't fight in flip-flops. Because if you are a fighter, maybe with the exception of like jujitsu, if you're on your back and you're looking up at the person you're fighting, that's not a good place to be. And so if they can somehow kick your legs out from under you and get you on your back, you're in, a bad, you're in a bad place. So he looks at this and he says, hey, how many times in the life of a believer do they not have the stability in their footing spiritually that they make a decision in their life because they're not sure what's right and what's wrong because mature-wise, spiritually, they, they haven't caught up. And they make a decision and for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they're suffering the consequences of those decisions. And he says, you can't afford to do that. You can't afford to find yourself on your back with the enemy on top of you pounding you. So he says that we are to have the gospel of peace. And so there are three areas in scripture where we, we, we understand the gospel of peace. One is the gospel of peace is as a believer, that we are made at peace with the holy God through Jesus Christ, okay? So the first one is peace with God through Christ. The second one is peace with ourselves because of what Christ has done for us. 
right? This is where we wrestle with forgiving ourselves for decisions that we've made in the past. This is where we wrestle with low self-esteem because we don't understand who we are in Christ, right? And then the third one is when we have peace with God and we have peace with ourselves, guess what else we're able to have? Peace with other people. Because if we don't have peace with ourselves and we don't have peace with God, you're never going to have peace with other people. Because a healthy relationship takes two things. It takes grace and it takes truth. Grace is, hey, I blew it. Will you forgive me? Truth is, dude, you can't do that anymore. Right? And if you don't have that in a relationship, then you have what I call a guarded relationship. Meaning that you're going to keep them at arm's length because it's not going to play, they're not going to play out to grace. Typically, they want all grace and no truth. Are you with me? So whenever we have in our life a lack of peace, then how it manifests itself is through worry, anxiety, being irritable at other people. And when we have that in our life, if we go all the way back, it simply means that we're not trusting God and we haven't come to terms with some issues that we're personally wrestling with. And when the enemy has that, man, it is like blowing the barn door open in your life. The enemy can come in and can attack you. And as a result, Paul says, what, you know, what happens is you don't have a stable footing and you're easily kicked, your feet are easily kicked out from under you for, for what's going on in your life. You know, and you just kick them right out from under them and onto the back they go and then they're in trouble. So he says, you've got to put on that important part of the, the, the piece, the, the footing, the cleats, all right? So number three in your outline is serenity, right? Serenity, and that is living and speaking the gospel of peace. Peace with God through Jesus Christ, peace with yourself for whatever you, decisions you've made and you understand that you're not your old self, that you're a new creation in Christ, and because of that, you can have peace with other people. Okay, are you all with me? And by the way, a manifestation of understanding your position in Christ is a freedom to share your peace with other people, right? Because you can say with confidence, hey, this is what God's done in my life. All right, and you're not, you don't have to feel uh, fearful of speaking the peace in li the life of other people. Are y'all with me? All right. So then verse 16 goes on, and it goes on, and it, and it says, uh, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, uh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows from the evil one. Okay? The, the, the uh, King James Version says the fiery darts, right? The fiery arrows. So, so let's talk a little bit about what that looks like in, in life, all right? So I got a page missing here. So in, in, in the shields, the shields are uh, roughly two and a half foot wide by four foot tall, okay? Now, someone says four foot tall, that, that's, that's a lot of body exposed. In those days, I would look like a giant, okay? So it wouldn't be uncommon that they would be under five foot tall. Right? So I could actually play basketball and slam on them. Okay? On a preschool basket. Okay? All right? So, so <clears throat> you have these, these little shields that they're using, and then the, the, the military guys would hold them in front. So you would have a front line group of people. Some cases, there's historians that say they stretched a mile long. And they walk side by side. You see riot police doing kind of the same thing. Right? And, and so it would be wood. And it would be leather, and it would be wrapped with oil, and some type of animal oil, because what they would shoot, would they would shoot arrows that are on fire, all right? So the first line of defense is the guys that have the shields. Sometimes they would have a second line of defense, and they would be holding their shields at a 45-degree angle in front of the person in front of them. And then everything is hand-to-hand -hand combat. So they're not shooting missiles, no drones, no tanks, none of that stuff. And they're just marching forward to ultimately get in a hand fight with someone. All right? So sometimes they would actually stack them back, and each person would hold their shield at a different angle. Because the goal was the guys in front weren't really the ones that they were concerned about. It was the archers in the back that were lobbing the arrows. And they're trying to lob the arrow over the front and stick the archers in the back. 
right? That's their goal. And, and so as they're walking through, and Paul is seeing this, he's saying, hey, you, you have to have the understanding that the enemy is constantly shooting these arrows of, of doubt into ultimately into your mind, okay? So, so number four in your outline is certainty, and that is training in the promises of God. Training in the promises of God. So we have integrity, purity, serenity, and now we have certainty in the promises of God. So where he says that we are to take the shield of faith, that word faith there is implying salvation. Not talking about all the areas in which we believe in the inerrance of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, but he's talking about salvation specifically. Why? Because it is when we invite Jesus into our life, and here's a theological word, that we begin to experience the sanctification of our sinful self to a holy God and begins to change our image into the image of Jesus. Okay, so this is what he's referring to. He's referring to us growing spiritually to look like Jesus in our life. Okay, and, that, and that's the faith in which he is, he is referring to. And, and so he's talking about the arrows that the enemies are using, the enemy is using, that's firing them over. And so the enemy is going to use our mind because that is the only way the enemy can get into our life. Thoughts feeling, action. So he's going to lob arrows, if you visualize it, as Paul is painting a parallel picture here, he's going to lob an arrow of doubt whoosh, over into your life. And if it's not going to stick in your shield of the promises of God, here's how it's going to play out. You're going to lay down in bed at night, you're going to put your head on your little pillow, and the enemy is going to come to you, and the enemy is going to say, are you kidding? You actually think that you praying for a loved one who's ill, a child that's not walking with the Lord, right, a marriage that's blowing up, you actually think, come on, that you're praying to an, an invisible God that you can't even see. You think that that is going to elevate through the ceiling into heaven, wherever that is, and God's going to hear you? And then as time goes on, you pray that prayer, and you're like, I believe that. And then you pray it, and the next day it doesn't happen. And then you have delay, and the enemy has got you right where he wants you. He's like, come on. What are you pretending? You're just playing around. Spiritual. Look at you. You're worthless. Think about what you thought about yesterday. Think about what you watched last night. Think about how you spoke to whoever. You think your prayers are going to touch the heart of God? If there is even a God? And we begin to believe our doubts. And we begin to doubt our beliefs. And the enemy's winning. Be because we don't have the strong footing that we need, and we don't have the sanity of having the protection in our thoughts and in our minds. And then as a result, we end up not thinking about what we're thinking about, and we fall into daydreaming, which is a danger zone, right? And then you start spinning out of control. And it happens all the time. Is there an amen to that? So he says in verse 17 that you're to take the helmet of salvation. Right? You're to have that, the helmet of salvation. And, and that is the promises, the certainty of God's promises in your life. And we're going to get into how we do that on a practical standpoint, right? See, if you're sitting here and you do not have the promises in your heart, you're not going to stand against the enemy. The enemy is not concerned about whether you went to church, 
whether you like Pastor Dan or not like Pastor Dan, he's not even concerned about you're going to rebuke him. He could care less about your words. He only cares about the word of God. And that's the only thing that brings fear and drives away the enemy in our life. And so if we, if we don't have that in our life, then all of a sudden that begins to happen. So every temptation directly or indirectly is an issue of doubt and trust. Do I believe God is good? Do I believe that he'll meet all my needs? Do I believe that or do I need to go to her to find it or buy that to get it? So trust and doubt is always at, at, uh, at, um, in the equation when it comes to temptation. Am I going to believe God or am I not? And the enemy is going to shoot constantly arrows into your life. So what is your defense? So number five in your outline, the fifth one is sanity. Okay, sanity. I thought about something kind of funny this morning. If you're sitting next to your spouse, turn to them and say, are you sane? Go ahead, because you've been wanting to say that for a long time. All right, so I'm just here to help out the marriages. <laughs> I was thinking about this morning. Pray for me. I have a lot of wondering thoughts from time to time. <laughs> so sanity is protect my mind from evil thoughts, right? Protect my mind from evil thoughts. And, and, and so in verse 17, he says, take on the helmet of salvation. All right. And, and so this is, I think, the most important piece of all the armor. And, and the reason why, if we could say that, and the reason why is because you've never fought anybody who's missing their head. You could fight a person who's missing a body part that isn't their head. But if you lose your head, game's over. Okay, so this becomes the most important part of the, that helmet of salvation because you're going to, again, be bombarded with doubt, with discouragement, with depression, with defeat, with thoughts of, of roaming thoughts that end up in no good place. And if you're not in control of what you're thinking on, then you're going to get run over. Right? And you think about Romans where it says that we renew our mind, that we don't conform to the, world of, uh, to, the, to the ways of this world, but we renew our mind by the word of God. Right? We, we, we put ourselves in the right headspace by memorizing and by, by reading and renewing our mind. And again, the enemy is not concerned about your words. He is concerned about God's word in his life. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says this, set your mind on things where? above, not on earthly things, right? So again, I, I did a series, I think it was last year, you know, half the time we don't even know what we're thinking on. So what are you thinking? Because if you're not thinking right and properly, then you end up having a mess. So real quick, so integrity, purity, serenity, certainty, and sanity are all pictures of Jesus, so just as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, is a picture of Jesus, Paul, as he talks about the, the armor of God, is a picture of Jesus, right? So he calls us to be like him. And so he calls us to have that in our life. And then the sixth one in your outline is maturity. And this is the ability to use the Bible as a weapon, to use the Bible as a, as a weapon in our life, okay? So in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, it gives us a picture of how physical maturity is similar to spiritual maturity. And so he says, in fact, though, by this time you ought to be teaching, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. In other words, sitting in a church does not make you spiritual. Just as sitting in your garage doesn't make you a car. Okay? So you can sit in church, doesn't mean anything. Right? You can like it, you can get a little bit from it, but, but in, in, in reality. And he goes on and he says <clears throat> that, um, that you need milk, not solid food. Verse 13, anyone who lives on milk is still an infant. Think about it in terms of a baby. You know, they start out with breast milk, they start out with formula, they start out with baby food. You know, then you get into some other stuff like uh, tri-tip and, and ribs. No, you don't? Uh-oh. I better apologize to my kids. 
So, <clears throat> and, and so they're, they're, they're doing that. And he goes on, he says, not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness because they're not at that level of sp uh, spiritual maturity. Verse 14, but solid food is for mature who are consistent use have, um, have trained, and then after this, have trained, and then what's the word after trained? Themselves. Pause. The church is responsible for creating environments to teach you how to train yourself. Okay? That's, that's the role of a pastor. To assist you in you growing yourself. All right. So, so my wife did this ex ex great with our boys because I grew up where mom did everything a little old school, right? I didn't do laundry. I didn't make my bed. I didn't make my lunch. Even when, even when I was, you know, 19, 20 years old and I was working, she, my mom would make my lunch, my bread and all that stuff. And so my buddies are like, hey, let's get an apartment. I'm like, why? <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, why would you do that? Well, my wife didn't come from that environment. So my kids, right, as they're growing, she's like, oh, no, they can clean the bathroom. They can do the laundry, right? They're like five years old. She goes, I'm going to teach you how to make eggs, right? They're holding the pan above the stove, one sitting on the counter going, flip it, because they can't see over the counter. And, you know, she's, she's like, hey, they're going to know. So when they were younger, everything was gray. Gray underwear, gray socks, gray everything, because if you mix white and dark colors, gray. So she's like, hey, let's just make it easy on them. Everything's gray, everything goes in. And so they knew that, where in my world, it was like, I didn't know that. I was, you know, in my 40s before I did that. And don't say my wife's not in here. I still pull that card. It's like, honey, I have no idea how to do laundry. Just kidding. Come on. Don't sell me out. Some of you are texting her right now, right? <laughs> so he says that we are to train ourselves in that, right? In verse 6, therefore let us leave elementary teachings about Christ and go on to what? To maturity, right? That, 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 that's where we're to go. That we are to have a weapon of offense, which is the sword, to use against the enemy who's constantly shooting at us so that we're able to take territory that the enemy has stolen. So we are going to drive back the enemy who snuck into our family and who began to run over our family environment, our work environment, our friends environment, our finances. And we're going to use the word of God to drive them back. Okay, are you all ready? The only way that you can do this is to memorize the Word of God. Okay? I have probably 22 versions, translations of Bibles in my office. They have zero impact in my life if I don't open them, read them, and memorize them. So, some of us grew up where we had a decorative Bible in the family room or living room on a, on, on a table. Right? And then someone even put like the lineage of, you know, our, our ancestors and so forth in there. And it was like, when was that ever opened? Oh, it's never been opened. Oh, okay. Well, what good is that? Right? Think of it in, in terms of a bad guy coming into the, into the house. It's like, excuse me, Mr. Bad Guy, hold on a second. I got to go and get my weapon. So just stand there. And then when I come out, I'm going to level you. Okay? I'm going to flay you. You're going to be dead, okay? And so then I go in my room and I get whatever my weapon of choice is to go fight. Is that how the enemy works? No. He doesn't call me up and go, hey, Dan, tomorrow around 2.12-ish, I'm going to put in front of you a picture that's going to get you in the weeds of life, right? And it's going to ruin your whole day. And you're going to think thoughts and you're, you're just going to go off into the wilderness in a bad way. So around 2.12, be ready for it. Is that how it works? No, all of a sudden I'm walking through life and boom, right in front of me. And if I don't have a weapon to fight against it, by the way, the first look is temptation, the second look is sin, right? If I don't have something to push back, I'm going to get run over, right? So, so, so it's important to us. So real quick in your outline, I have in there... <clears throat> In, in uh, Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 4 of Matthew uh, gospel, Jesus models this idea of having a verse to call out against temptation. In all three of the temptations, Jesus 
was called to misuse his power in an ungodly way. He had the power to do it, and it was legitimate for him to do. But it was done in an ungodly way, right? And so in Matthew chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 3, I'm not going to read it all just real quickly. So he he's, he's hasn't eaten in 40 days, and the devil comes and says, hey, turn that stone into bread. Legitimate, right? Takes him up on the roof and, and says, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you jump, and the angels from heaven will catch you before you go splat on the ground. And, and then he comes and he says, hey, you know what? Here's all the kingdoms of this world. Why don't you bow down and worship me and I'll give them to you? In fact, he had the kingdoms, right? So they're all legitimate in an ungodly way. So Jesus answers in verse 4 of each of them, so the next group of, of passages. Jesus answered, it is written. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 7, Jesus answered, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Verse 10, and Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In verse 11, and the devil left him and the angels came to attend to him. Do you have an it is written in your life? Because the enemy is going to use it. So you can jot these down. I did a little homework for you. So let's say that you are not strong, that, that you seem to get run over on a regular basis with temptation or whatever the case is. And so in Ephesians, how you would fight against it is you would call out a scripture and you would quote the scripture. So if you had like Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, it says, finally be strong in the Lord and mighty in his power. So if I feel a moment of weakness, I'm reminding myself, Dan, you're not fighting in your power, man. That's the problem. You need to fight in God's power in your life. And so I would then quote that. If, if there's times in my life where I feel like I'm, you know, I'm a loser, I'm not going to make it, whatever the case is, then I need to remind myself of Romans chapter 8, verse 11. <clears throat> and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life in your mortal bodies through the spirit who lives in you. And so in times where I feel like I don't have the strength, I will, I will recall that. Moments of forgiveness. Have you ever wrestled with forgiveness? Where maybe you haven't forgiven yourself of something that you've done in your past? Well, then I would say Psalms 103 verse 12. For as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed the transgressions in my life. You feel like you're broken you're a broken human being, you didn't somehow, you know, come out the way that whatever, then I remind myself in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that I am a new creation in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come, okay? The mind of Christ, you ever have your mind wander into the place where it shouldn't be? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. And so my goal is to have my mind on the instructions of the Lord. Fear. You ever lay in bed scared? <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Right? So the enemy doesn't care about the words that you use unless they are the words of God. Okay, that is your weapon, and this is why maturity of understanding it is so important. So in your outline, <clears throat> if you don't have an it is written, right, then you're going to get run over. Too often we have, I know I shouldn't. And if you lay in bed or you sit on the park bench or you're driving in the car and you're wrestling with those fiery darts that, are, that the enemy is shooting at us and you, all your thought is, is, you know what, I shouldn't be thinking on this, I shouldn't be thinking on this, I shouldn't be thinking on it. What are you thinking on? It. What has, you, has your mind has you? And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Thoughts, feelings, action. Now you know why you're in the mess, right? Because you don't have an it is written. So how do we put on the armor of God? Through prayer and knowledge of the truth. There's no shortcuts, folks. Right? No magic bullet. 
Now, the good thing is we live in a time where if you're wrestling with anxiety, you can go to the theologian, Mr. Google, and you can say passage of scripture on anxiety. And for the most part, it will do actually pretty well for you. So, so you, you, you don't have to necessarily have a concordance in the old days and flip through a book and all that kind of stuff. You, you, you can do that. And so in Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 18, it says, um, uh, And pray in the Spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and, and, and always keep on praying for the saints. Right? So here's the pushback, and we'll close. The pushback is, well, Pastor Dan, I have a hard time memorizing stuff. Is there an amen to that? Can you tell me what your social security number is? Not, not really. But you know it. You know your PIN number to the ATM, right? Some of you know your driver's license number. You know combinations to locks or, or that you may have at work or whatever in your, in your garage. So you know what's important to you. So here's the life. If you don't have a weapon of offense to memorize the word of God, then you will continue to find yourself on your back, looking up at the enemy, and finding yourself in a bad spot. So you have to memorize scripture. And you have to be able to recall it in those moments of need. Now, someone will say, well, what if I don't know the address? It's okay. Just quote the scripture, right? Just quote the scripture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather today. And Lord, as we leave here today, I recognize that us as believers are being uh, uh, tempted, that Father, the enemy is after to steal, kill, and destroy everything that's important to us. And so, Lord, we want to put on the full armor of God. And as we leave here, that we will leave with that confidence in our life. That, Lord, if there's areas where the enemy has taken ground, that we will begin to use your word to, to, to make a way to push back where the enemy has encroached into our life. And, Father, give us, uh, give us the mindset, the memory, all the different things that are necessary to put that on in our life to begin to give us victory as we begin to walk with you. And if you're here today, you're watching on t on online and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity as we close to invite Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior. You can't have the armor of God on without a personal relationship with Christ. And so if that's where you're at and you feel like God's tugging at your heart, I'm going to say a prayer. You don't have to say it out loud. Just repeat silently as I say this. Just say, Lord Jesus, I admit and I acknowledge that I have sinned, that I have missed the mark. And Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for, for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. And Lord, grow me that I would become all that you desire for me to be. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And Lord, may we have a week focused on thanksgiving that you are the provider of all things. You're, the, you're a good God who gives good things to his children. And Lord, I pray that as we gather with our family and friends, that that will be on our heart and in our spirit, that we're to pause to be thankful. It is in Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said. Amen. Hang out for a second. Let me close real quick. If you prayed that prayer with me, um, there's a, a card that Eric mentioned that connect card you can check baptism accepting christ put a name on it drop it in the box uh, on the way out if you're in need of prayer there'll be some folks up here in the front for prayer and also in room 201 so have a great thanksgiving eat to your heart's content next week we'll talk about gluttony god bless you what an incredible experience remember we go live every weekend so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content I also want to invite you to join us for an in-person service when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week and remember, God loves you.